If you would like to support the podcast and get some extra content while you're there, head on over to patreon.com forward slash severe MMA podcast and sign up. From the rewatch to the Q&A, we will have loads of content every week. So sign up, patreon.com forward slash severe MMA podcast. And now, here's the podcast. Graham McDonald is an idiot. Sean Sheehan of severemma.com. He even has the audacity to call himself the quote unquote pod god. This is severe MMA. 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 The Severe MMA podcast is finally here. Welcome to the Severe MMA podcast. Here's your host, Sean Sheehan. Welcome, welcome everybody. It's episode 384 of the Severe MMA podcast. My name is Sean Sheehan, joined today by Graham McDonald. We're going to have a bit of a different podcast today because um, some, someone describes this last few weeks as the off season in mixed martial arts. And I don't know about that considering, uh, <laughs> you know, it's probably the on season for uh, us covering the sport here in Ireland and a lot of the fans here in Ireland. But it has been, there hasn't been that much fights, there hasn't been lots to talk about, but we will. I'm sure we'll talk about some of the fights and we'll have a, a general chat about uh about mixed martial arts and, and we'll see where it goes but before we get into all of that um we must tell you that it's welcome to fresh ball fall it's the season of pumpkin spice and making sure your crotch looks nice that means sipping cider in an autumn breeze and using manscape products to trim your balls with ease that's right today's show is brought to you by manscaped a company here to make sure that your foliage isn't the only thing shedding it's excess leaves. Heck, even Mother Nature knows it's time to lose the excess clutter for autumn. Join the 6 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping using our code SEVERE MMA. Whether you're brand new or already with us at Manscaped, you could use the crown uh, jewel of care for your family jewels, the Platinum Package 4.0. With a glorious package, you can align your entire hygiene routine all in one swoop inside. The 10-part Platinum Package, everything uh, you need uh, and love, and you know and love, about the performance package plus some shower goodies included uh, to elevate your grooming game to platinum the uh, lawnmower 4.0 everyone knows about that the weed whacker for your uh, nose and ear hair um, they both have the proprietary skin safe technology um, to protect your delicate parts and holes uh, both are waterproof so you can keep scaping even as the weather changes. In addition to saving, you now have to completely upgrade your shower routine with the Ultra Premium Body Wash and Ultra Platinum 2-in-1 Shampoo and Conditioner. You'll have your skin and hair feeling hydrated and smelling as fresh as the daisies. Don't forget, they have their uh, aluminum-free Ultra Premium deodorant. Um, and don't worry, it's not com- pumpkin spice, it's cologne quality fragrance. But we shouldn't have a signature scent for our pits. Um, we, we shouldn't save it, sorry, just for our pits. But the crop preserver is for your balls. The odorant down there. And a crop reviver helps it uh, get back to uh, that uh, the A1 chip. So Manscaped even threw in two free gifts. The boxers, which I know the lads in the, our group absolutely love, and the shared travel bag as well, which I use all the time. I've I actually had another one for years, and like the strap was like continuously breaking off it. But the shared travel bag, none of those. It's like really premium, really good leather, very good. But uh, I think it's leather anyway. Maybe maybe it's not leather, but whatever material is really really good. But specifically made to hold your goodies. Get the platinum package this fall. Uh, autumn. I try always try always I'm trying to like put in autumn there. It says fall here when I'm reading, but I try to put in autumn. These products are guaranteed to hit your dangly bits. To be hits for your dangly bits. To hit your dangly bits? They're not guaranteed to hit your dangly bits, not to be hits for your dangly bits. So go to manscaped.com, get twenty percent off for free shipping with the code severe and minutes. Twenty percent twenty percent off with free shipping at manscaped.com when you use the code severe MMA Manscaped. Clear out the leaves, it's your free trunks time. To shine. And before we get into the podcast as well, I know I said at the start of the podcast, but we're, you know, we're relatively towards the start of the month. Um, if you would like, head on over to patreon.com forward slash severe podcast and uh, support us there. 
Uh, it's only four fifty a month. The price of a, a breakfast roll above in Dublin, or the, the price of a breakfast roll down here now as well. If we're being honest, uh, and if you wouldn't like to do that, just hit subscribe here, wherever you're listening to this. Uh, run on over to our YouTube, click subscribe there, and go to Spotify or iTunes, whichever you use, and click subscribe there as well. It'd be absolutely massive help for us, and uh, we would uh, we would really appreciate it. So that's all of the ads and bullshit out the way. Let's get straight to the podcast here with myself and Graham. All right, Graham, how are you here? We we kind of uh we kind of started our conversation before we uh we did the podcast. Well, uh, do you know the memories are just floating back to me. I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, that happened. I fucking barely remember that. So we we're going to talk a little bit about Irish MMA and to start here, but it could go into anything, I suppose. We're going to have a bit of a more of an open kind of conversation. But um, we threw it into our, our severe group, and Andy uh, said to talk about the, maybe the early years of Irish MMA or the, even the battle zones and stuff. I actually I want to talk a little bit about Owen Roddy as well after you put up that clip of him earlier on today and I know a few people asked about Owen Roddy on the Q&A this week as well so we'll get into him in a second but the early days Graham like th- those battle zones and stuff you were just saying before we started about sending in the records to Jordan Breen and all and I'm uh, sure I have them up here and they're pretty good all the battle zones in line they're, they're better than other places anyway we'll, we'll yeah, say that, yeah. but it's, uh, it was a, a mad scene back this then should be, so, this should be your point about uh, why Sherdog is better not, uh, yes. <laughs> not the other points you, you missed the trick there yeah, yeah no absolutely uh, obviously See, topology hasn't been around as long and Sherdog's been around a long long time and Sherdog was basically like the official record keeper even Wikipedia like if you were Tito Ortiz or Chuck Liddell you had a Wikipedia back then but if you were some Irish fighter or some like you know middle of the road uh, UFC fighter even you, you didn't have a even a Wikipedia or, and your your record on Sherdog if you were an Irish fighter was usually all over the place and fights weren't getting added to records for months and I just basically like Jordan Breen from Sherdog I think I just emailed Sherdog or whatever the the fight finder at Sherdog or whatever it was and Jordan Breen, Breen replied and I started sending you need to send like the referee the location the the weight it's not just as simple as this guy beat this guy so you actually need a fair amount of information for Sherdog to accept it so uh yeah, I took it upon myself to basically gather up as much uh, information as I could, fights that I could prove happened and, like, you know, might be on, like, Fight Hounds or something back then. There might be an event that just wasn't on Sherdog and get that updated and uh, things like that. So, yeah, uh, that's basically how uh, uh, what I had to do to get kind of Irish MMA fighters' records up to date on, on Sherdog. You could, like, that's hard to even fathom today with considering, like, even the, the the very smallest local promotions are even like getting streamed or there'll be, you know, there'll be someone there covering or there'll be someone there tweeting out the results or, you know, it'll be up on some website somewhere. It's it's mad to think that, and we, that's not too far away. Like I remember watching like, or, or thinking about, hearing about big enough cards, not even in Ireland, but in other places. And it was like impossible to get results for like days or, or weeks or something. You might have to like look to, to see someone who was there and maybe tweet. Oh, yeah. or even you email a promoter and they, they're they like, they won't even send you the results or yeah. just not replying. And it's just like, do you not want your show to be like recognized <laughs> or, like the official fight finder? And it didn't give a shit. It was just like, you know, I'm just putting fights on so my, my guys can fight or the family can come out. Like, you know, there was no real organization to these things compared to what there is now. Yeah, I, I know. There's even one lad I know going around who has one loss in his record and it's not up on topology or short dog or anywhere. So I think if I think if he keeping that going anyway over in Canada there, that old fella. But it was name, name him. <laughs> I won't name him. I won't name him. I, won't, I wouldn't do it to him. No, I wouldn't do it. To him. But uh, <laughs> he's, he's, there was, I actually came up on my uh, Facebook there like two or three days ago with Stephen Lowry saying, oh, battle zone is coming back. You know, and this is maybe three or four years ago and it hasn't uh, it hasn't come back but uh, Andy Ryan was on about bringing it back as like the Cage Warriors Academy was and well did they have one of those shows maybe but I, I think the old yeah, yeah. the old school ones were like they, they must have been unbelievable Graham like to get MMA like that and to get like 10-15 fights like that with good matchmaking it must have been a joy for you when you're coming up uh, covering the Irish scene 
Yeah, it really was. Like, there was big atmospheres in them small arenas. Like, the Regency Hotel, obviously, uh, is kind of infamous now. But back then, it was, like, you know, Battle Zone's home. And it was real small packed. It was a, just basically, you see the same old heads, the same Irish MMA community guys there. Every, every time there was an event, and everybody was, like, knowledgeable and in, really into it. Like, and, you know, compared to, you'd be able to buy a ticket at the door, no problem, even though there's only about, what, four or 500 people allowed in there. So, even less, probably. Um, so yeah, you know, it was, it was a really tight knit community back then. And, you know, you'd have family, friends, teammates and all. So it would be, it would be a spectacular atmosphere. Like I remember the atmosphere during, um, during film Mo Peter and John Donnelly, I think it was, it might've even been rich, the rich Corey fight. I'm not exactly sure, but, uh, I brought a few of my friends with me to, to, to fight. And a friend of mine, who's like kind of a calm guy, like not really, you know, too shouty or emotional. He was like not even an MMA fan, and during the Mopeter fight, he was up screaming with everybody else. <laughs> and I just, I just remember you like you just get sucked in. Like it was, like there were some really good times. Obviously, you know, back then we would have, we would have dreamed, wouldn't have even dreamed probably of like where, where, where it went and how popular it is. And the, even the, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Bellator in the three arenas, an amazing, amazing. Uh, thing for Irish MMA from where, where where it came where it was only 10 years ago and how long how uh, far it's come but uh in in a li- in another way you kind of miss those um <laughs> those days as well because there was some absolutely spectacular events and battle zone those two battle zones in a row i think it was five and six the Mopeter main event against donnelly and gory especially were absolutely amazing fights and i remember uh, satanta used to satanta sports was a similar to premier sports now in, in ireland and the uk used to air cage contender and battle zone and stuff but they'd they'd air it like weeks afterwards and edited and things like that like and i remember people just asking oh what this i heard about this mo peter john donnelly fight oh do you have a video of it or whatever we weren't uh we didn't have a full video because we weren't allowed to film it like that because satanta had the the, the exclusive or whatever but they they take months to put it out and when they did finally put out the donnelly mo peter fight it was like edited from five rounds down to three rounds and made it look like donnelly won the fight it's just like oh my god but uh, yeah, so I wonder. I wonder. Who, I wonder we'll be able to get that fight. I actually tried to get it, and yeah. uh, a few years ago, and I thought I was getting it. I got put on by Andy Ryan to whoever from Satanta or whatever production company worked for Satanta, and they were like, "Oh yeah, we'll dig it out and we'll send it to you." And it took months and months, and they finally sent it to me, and it was the uh, edited three round version. Fuck! I and, do you know what? Yeah. I, I actually know someone working for Santa. I'll, I'll have a look. I'll just see if I can get it. But it, it probably doesn't even exist. They probably edited it, got rid of the fucking old one, and kept that that three round disaster. Yeah, I think I, I think like I had asked. Oh, I said, "Oh, you only aired a." Three, three round version do you have the five round version and they were like yeah 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 but then when they came back it, they didn't they just had the three round version so That's a fucking I don't know if they were lazy or if, if uh, they're fed up with me just fucking annoying them for months yeah. and didn't want to go through it again so maybe maybe it does exist but yeah maybe it doesn't that was probably before the time of like really good smartphones as well so I, there's probably some video out there of it somewhere on a fucking an iPhone one or something but yeah that was a classic like I'm even looking at the, the early battle zones here and like you see names you know like playing O'Driscoll playing lost it a guy called Sean Cogan who only had two amateur fights and he won both of them and he's never fought again one in 2010 one in 2017 like isn't that cool like he, he's a win over the Irish uh, MMA professional fighter of the year from what 2020 or a couple of years ago as well and he's only ever had two professional or two uh, amateur fights that's kind of mad like and I, there's names like that pop up all over the place you know I was even talking to Ian about it the other day you know kind of I'm sure there was a lot of lads like, ah, sure, we'll try out a bit of MMA or we go train and then, you know, they have a couple of fights and they're like, ah, sure, you know, I have a job or I'm you know, going over to England or I'm going to America or somewhere and that'll be that. And there's, a, it, there's a lot of that, but Irish MMA was kind of built on that. It was like you needed those people to have those fights. And then, you know, you have the likes of John Donnelly, you have the likes of Henry Felipe and this opening one as well. What about John Donnelly, Graham? Like he's a guy whose name always pops up whenever people are, are talking about uh, about the early days of Irish MMA out of Team Rhino, seven and six, like hasn't fought since yeah. 2012, but he's a I good... I remember, players. like, you know, Irish MMA was such a kind of, hadn't really gone anywhere. We hadn't got to the UFC really bar... Colin Robinson had kind of got there uh, from up from north, and Tom Egan had kind of got there, but they they felt like no disrespect to those guys. I said it before, and it kind of does sound disrespectful, but I think they, they it used to be a fact the UC would go to a region and kind of pick up a local guy just to kind of get the crowd in there, and I think that was more the reason they hadn't really like you know. Uh, 
cleared out the the local scene or the European scene and kind of demanded a contract. It was just kind of a circumstantial thing. So, you know, Gegard Mousasi having or uh, John Donnelly having fucked Gegard Mousasi was yeah. like a huge thing. Oh, just John Donnelly fucked Gegard Mousasi. You know what I mean? It was like, oh my god, <laughs> like kind of funny that like you know it's going even though we're going through the kind of Gunnar Nelson and Jeff Monsoon. Uh, Jeff Mons and uh, grappling match as well, like you know, things like that were like huge because we we didn't really have anything. We just had like the you know Irish guys fighting Irish guys was or fighting fighting an English guy was you know the foreigner coming in. <laughs> there was no money to be drafting in you know Europeans or Americans or anything like that. It was it was a very kind of closed circle of uh, scene. Uh, that fight. Every time I see Gegger Musasi John Nanny, I've probably seen it like four or five times down through the years on Shardog. It like shocks me every time. The rings Ireland Bushida. So that was on that was on in Ireland. Were you at that fight, Gegger Musasi and John Donnelly? Or that was no, a long no, time ago. No, that was, that was like, when was that? That was yeah. he, that, that was years before. That was two thousand and five. Yeah. Fucking hell. Long yeah, time no, ago. I, that was that was a long time ago, yeah. That's mad to even see it, it and you see Andy that Ryan lost to Rob Brown and the main yeah. event. <laughs> That's how it was to be so Andy. But, uh, <laughs> it brought us down. It brought us down. But it's like it's it's madness. You see lads then like on the top, uh, this Abdu So guy, who I, I wonder who he is. He <laughs> he headlined the first two battle zone cards. Um you know, and uh, I don't know what he, he's what, what's his record one four and one. Like, where did this guy come out well, of? That record could guy? be that could be anything. There could be more <laughs> wins, more losses. Who knows? Back yeah. then, you know, two thousand seven, like it was his first fight, so it was a wild west back then. Even some of them wins could be completely fake. Or that one, no, well, that one win was at Battle Zone. That's probably not fake, but yeah, all... you know, back then people were fucking faking record. Even even now, I think Sherlock put out the other day somebody had like faked the. Some UFC fighter had faked to Oh yeah, man, that monster off and all that stuff. So there was yeah. loads of that shit going on back then. Hundred percent. On the second battle zone card, you fucking Paul Redmond versus Artem Lobov. If that happened today, that that could fucking headline a card, a card in the tree arena today. Like that's absolutely fucking massive. What a what a fight that was. Yeah. There was a lot of that back in there though, wasn't there? You know, and some of the lads like you say, even like a, a Red Zero or a Brian Moore and stuff. Their records are probably you look at them today and they're like you know whatever, like fourteen and seven or whatever. But those fucking seven losses are probably fighting fucking middleweights or fighting the, like the best of the best right back then that, a lot of that happened too didn't it and that fucking Paul Redmond Artem fight back in to the, what year is it 2011 11 years ago that's kind of mad to even think that happened isn't it yeah it's mad like even like you know I always think of Neil Seary he hadn't fought like anywhere near his his weight class until, until I don't know until well into his career until he was an old man you, you know he was fighting all like any fight you can get I suppose fighting up at middleweight for for uh, somebody as small as Neil Siri, you know, the division, even in the UFC, the 155 division had kind of uh, been scrapped and been brought back and didn't really, you know, what was, wasn't really sure if that was happening. And the rest of the divisions, like even just before WEC, like not that long ago, before the UFC bought WEC, they didn't even have uh, featherweight, bantamweight, flyweight, you know what I mean? So these guys were just had to take whatever fight they, they wanted back then. And that, you know, when somebody like Neil Siri started fighting, what was it, two thousand and five? You know, you basically, if you if you wanted to fight, you just got to take whatever you're offered on any kind of notice. And if you're injured, well, you know, can can you walk? Yeah, you're good to go. So uh, yeah, people like Loboff and and uh, Neil Siri, who maybe have um, you know records that maybe held them back a little bit, maybe delayed them getting signed for the UFC, but. You know those those experiences against those tough guys on short notice, up divisions and stuff. That obviously stands you in good stead uh, for when you when you go in there against tough competition uh, in the future. And you know, there's obviously a big debate about um, padding your record and stuff. But you definitely couldn't accuse people back then of padding their record. You're just you're just going in there. You don't know anything about the guy. You're just you're just signing the fight and for the the passion of it. There was no money in it. You barely cover your expenses if, if even. So, uh, yeah, you know, tribute to these guys who who fought in these events, like, you know, uh, like not just Siri and Redmond and, uh, you know, all the early SVG guys, but, you know, Rodney Moore, who's who's obviously had success as a coach as well. And he, he had some really big fights, like even that Dean Lister fight. You know, these are these were absolutely huge fights at the time, like a UFC veteran, like bringing in Shannon Googerty with him as well, Dean Lister, you know, th- those were huge moments in, in Irish MMA that kind of, a lot of people, when the majority of people who are Irish MMA fans completely missed and maybe don't even know what happened. 
Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I, I think on Neil Seary as well, just that you mentioned it, I think that Neil Seary signing for the UFC was actually like a big turning point as well for Irish MMA because I, it, it felt like it gave everyone hope, you know? It, and like, even if you look at, say, the gyms today, uh, you know, like the lads up the north going into the Cage Warriors route and trying to get to the UFC, or like Ian Gary coming out of Team KF, you know, trying to get to the UFC. You, you, no, okay, maybe it's a bit different with Bellator that you basically have to be, uh, you, you basically have to be SBG. But th- I feel like that sort of signing gave everyone up. Like, and I think it showed as well, like the power of the Irish MMA fan base because we really pushed that to get Neil Siri on that uh, on that card uh, against uh, against Brad Pickett in, in over in London and he did and he you know had a really good run in the UFC yeah. won a good yeah. few fights I think it was I think you're right but I think it wasn't just a signing it was how he did in the UFC as well yeah. it was like oh these guys can handle themselves these guys can win fights these guys can hang with somebody like Brad Pickett on a few days notice you know and box them up on the feet like people were kind of remember Gary Davis for that remember <laughs> oh god oh god what was he saying again he was like uh, this guy's gonna try to out grapple Brad Pickett or something like that Is it, was it or? yeah yeah, yeah. no chance on the feet or something like that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. he's out there absolutely boxing him up yeah but I it's and Siri was Siri was always a guy to suck out I remember one, I wrote an article about Siri and before I was even with Severa May and you were uh, t- asking me about it and everything and uh, it was a, a, probably a big part of the reason I came over to Severa May I suppose but it was I always found his story absolutely fascinating and you know he's a guy that I think we can learn a lot from everyone always looks at McGregor and they always look at you know either you know Gary now or whoever it might be Artem the lads down through the years but I think Neil Siri is a very interesting one because he's a guy as you said you know like Queenie as well as I think is another uh, uh, good example of this and I've really gained a lot of um, you know respect for, for them lads down through the years the way they and and you know I, I maybe not I don't not necessarily agree with it, but the way that it came through and you had to do it back then as you just said, fighting lads up away, fighting on short notice, taking tough fights, getting in there and doing it and learning your craft. Like Neil Siri did that, and as you said, by the time he got to fight Brad Pickett, sure he was well able to fight Brad Pickett and beat Phil Harris and win another few fights in the UFC. You know, going went to a decision with uh, with Lewis Malk and and Kyoji Haraguchi. There's, there's a lot to be said for that. He fought fucking Pandosia. You know, one of the best flight weights of all time uh, in the UFC uh, like I, I, and he always hung tough you know he never was always, the, yeah. outclassed or anything he always in, in the fight like you know a real tough guy hard nosed and he was 10 years past think, his prime like as well for yeah. a smaller guy it was incredible and he's what he did. working out like we made a video about him he's working like a warehouse job he's looking after his kids he's trying to get the training in whenever he can you know it's a it's not like uh, these days where everybody has all these sponsors come like coming through as amateurs and when they're turning pro they've got like you know uh, these long term sponsors that are local companies like for example Kieran Clark talking uh, recently in um, an interview with us about how all these sponsors have been with him for ages and he's got these kind of fan base that come everywhere with him you know it, it was a different time you know these these fighters these days have it easy uh, compared to somebody like Neil Siri like Neil Siri like if he had of uh, throughout his career been able to been able to train full time and not have to worry about you know working a warehouse shop getting up early all that stuff like you can go look at that video we made uh, leading up to his UFC Dublin fight uh, if you just type into YouTube like Neil series or MMA should be there um yeah so like you know it, it, it wasn't easy to to fit in uh his training and obviously he's coaching as well to make a little bit more money on the side and he, he's a tough-nosed bastard and he, you know you can see that in his fight style and I think people really latched on to to Neil like as kind of working class hero and uh you know the receptions he got when he won fights or when he came out at ufc dublin and the support he got on um on twitter as you mentioned when he when people were campaigning for the the late replacement against brad pickett when he got signed to the ufc and you know uh, i think obviously neil's a uh not really a you know outwardly sensitive guy but i, I definitely think you know that touched him that the the the, the fans got behind him so much yeah, 100%. And, uh, like, I love as well the fact that he never, you know, I suppose you can't do it in Team Rhino where he's coming from, but he he, he never, like, f- 
faltered in what he believed in and all of that, which was great. Like that interview he did with Andrew, I think it was over in Holland uh, when he uh, when he fought over there, and he was talking about like these lads need to be careful. Like these lads can't be fucking giving up work, giving up their whole aspirations for life just thinking they're going to be the next Conor McGregor. And he was like, "You're not. If you're in the next fucking Neil Siri, you might you might be very very lucky." And I, that's something that's always rung true, you know, with me list, you know, listening to fighters talk and then listening to say, "Oh, we're going to go and do this and do that." And I, yeah, you might like and hopefully you do and it'd be great for everyone if you did but what if you didn't and I think Siri always had that sort of voice on him and I think it was always very very smart because he's known and he's seen it like you know I heard, I heard, I don't know if this is true, it probably is, like, I don't know why anybody loved but I heard from somebody that uh, around the time, kind of the, the McGregor explosion, the Irish MMA explosion, people, loads of people coming into training, Team Rhino, loads of young kids and, you know, teenagers and things like that. And Neil Seary would say to them straight away, like, you're never going to be the next McGregor, do you still want to train here? <laughs> like, you know, just straight away, like, just <laughs> what a brutal what honesty, a that, uh, you know. But what a great man. <laughs> in fair, a bit of a prick, but what a great man uh, at the same time. Graham. I would ask you about Artemi Sitsinkov. Like, this guy, he must have been... <laughs> He's like a bolt from the blue coming for Irish MMA. Look at his record here. 15 and 17. 15 wins all by submission. Uh, he, he's 39 now but he fought again a couple of years ago I'm like oh, he's, he's lost like 6 or 7 in a row but God, get this man how, how many of them was by leg locks I think like 80% of them or something or, or <laughs> it's a, it's a, so he's arm bar knee bar knee bar arm bar uh, flying arm bar arm bar arm bar reverse knee bar arm bar knee bar arm bar triangle choke guillotine choke he's a lot of different ones arm bar rear naked choke I would lo- cage legacy. Get this man a fight. Like get, get this man a fight on who, who's a good like one forty five pounder. Lee Hammond. How about Lee you, Hammond? You find at one forty five these days. Or what, I don't know. Maybe one fifty five. He fought Neil Searish or what? One, 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 one thirty five. I'd say he fought. He fought Paddy Hulahan uh, in the ten thousand hours or at the cage contender fourteen. Uh, he fought Conor McGregor. He'd fight it yeah. anyway. This man. Yeah. Get, get, what a fight to, imagine that Lee Hammond versus our team he's to think of I I don't know maybe I'm gone mad he's lost like seven fights in a row and people are Andy, <laughs> Andy Stevens have gone mad about it but it just it'd be absolutely brilliant and if people don't know who our team is to of is uh 2008, June 28, he beat Conor McGregor by knee bar. He beat, uh, he's beat James Doolan. He beat Steve McComb. He beat Neil Searin. Uh, we all know they're all by submission, as we just said earlier on. This guy was just came in and absolutely wrecked the place. And like, I remember Conor talking in an interview, and actually John Cavanaugh talking in an interview, I think with, with Paul Dollery a few years uh, ago, a long time ago, before he had the book and everything over in like the 42 or somewhere like that, and saying like that loss and the Joseph Duffy loss as well, like changed the game for not just McGregor, but for I think a lot of Irish MMA as well, knowing the level of jiu-jitsu that's out there, that they will have to, they'll have to fight. And, you know, Paddy Hoolan went in there and, uh, in oh, a few years later, in 2012, and he ended up submitting to think of himself. So I suppose that will show you. Got stuck, you kind in of a, got stuck in a knee bar for momentarily yeah. and had to fight out of it at the start of the fight, and ended up getting the, getting the triangle. Obviously, uh, if anybody hasn't seen the documentary Ten Thousand Errors about Paddy Hula and Owen Roddy fighting at Cage Contender 14, that was obviously a huge event at the time for Irish MMA. In the basketball arena, was like the biggest arena we had. I think it was about two thousand, two and a half thousand people. Uh, Owen Roddy was like the the main guy at the time. He was going in there against uh, Shannon Googerty, who had, you know, uh, fought in the UFC several times, wins in the UFC. I think he um, choked Matt Grice out unconscious at UFC 100. If uh, I think so, uh, he was a you know UFC 100 is a big deal. He was a big name. Um, he'd come over with Dean Lister and. Uh, obviously, John Ferguson was running cage cont- or cage contender at the time, yeah, and uh, had a TV deal. Was looking to put on bigger fights, and these were the kind of the biggest fights we'd had in, in Irish MMA. And uh, Paddy Hulahan was a big prospect. I think he was nine and zero at the time. And obviously, uh, Setenkov had a big name, as you mentioned. He'd beaten Siri, he'd beaten McGregor. Uh, it was kind of a test to see if Paddy was a real deal. Everybody had heard about Paddy's jiu jitsu and stuff like that, and obviously, that was a that was a huge win. Uh, in front of a big crowd and kind of uh, I think that was actually Paddy's he signed for Cage Warriors after that but he never actually fought for them because he went on the Ultimate Fighter um, he injured his back Josh, didn't Josh, he Josh, yeah he got injured and um, fought on anyway and ended up losing the decision to, to Josh Hill uh, but ended up obviously getting to the UFC and UFC Dublin which, which is obviously uh 
really huge momentous moment for for Irish MMA as well uh, that card but uh, yeah Paddy Houlihan and obviously Owen Roddy fighting through that, that rear naked choke that Shannon Googly was known for had it locked in and coming back to win the decision was was obviously you know you can see it in the 10,000 dirt 10,000 hours documentary the crowd was going crazy uh, it was it, it, beating a UFC veteran was like the best thing you could do besides winning in the or fighting in the UFC and winning in the UFC back then that card was unbelievable it, it makes me think we'll get into it in a second but why don't cage warriors put on uh, an event in, in the national basketball arena if you said to what two and a half thousand people that'd be absolutely ideal for them like this card that they have coming up here with Paul Hughes and loads of other Irish guys on it put that on there like you'd, you'd sell as many tickets there as you will in uh, whatever arena they're going to in England like and it, 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 uh, you know it'd be absolutely raucous I don't know maybe the national basketball arena don't do MMA anymore or something but I don't know like, let's <laughs> you know what, they, they should be looking into that they should be trying to do it but uh, that card is amazing Carl Moore was on that card as well it feels like yeah, I, think, Moore. I think people have I heard I probably can't really say too much but I heard people were uh, organisers were trying to get National Basketball Arena as a venue back but uh, it doesn't seem to have happened I'm, I'm not sure why maybe maybe they aren't interested anymore I think there's been an issue all around Dublin with like insurance and different things I remember last last time we, it came up like it's very few areas in Dublin will actually get insured for combat sports and maybe it's I don't know what it is, what, what the issue is there, but it's, um, you know, I think the Tree Arena obviously is a big one. It's going to be big insurance anyway. And if you're putting on an arena, uh, if you're putting on an event there, you can kind of afford it. But like, yeah, I don't know. Cage Warriors, like, it's tough for Cage Warriors, I suppose. They're, people want them to spend all this money and they want to pay all their fighters and they want to, but they, like, Cage Warriors have been run by, you know, <laughs> they don't have big investors. They don't have big money or anything like that. And it's it's tough for them. But anyway, I suppose that's kind of off topic. And yeah, kind of if it's not about. broke, don't fix it. Kind of yeah, lost it's tough. That, that, what about, uh, you know, uh, as you said, that card was unbelievable, though. Ivan Salivary, even on it. You know, we hear his name all the time with Joe Rogan on it. Against Fraser Opry, Paddy Hoolan, Carl Moore, you know, the Joe McCulgan and James Sexual Healing as well. And, uh, 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 you know, we, we know where Joe went to be a, a champion. Like, if, if you look at that, you Joe McCulgan champion in Cage Warriors, Carl Moore champion in Cage Warriors, and you know top ranked guy now today. Paddy Hoolan got to the UFC, and oh, Owen Roddy didn't. Like Owen Roddy is one of these cases of a guy. Like he's eleven and four his record, and he won what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fights in a row in and in Shannon Gugarty. All of them, apart from the Gugarty one by a finish if Owen Roddy was around there I was back in 2012 there's no doubt about it Owen Roddy being in either Bellator on top of cars like Aquili or something like that or in the UFC there's oh, no doubt about it absolutely in the UFC yeah back then though the UFC there was a you know a high bar of UFC caliber that people used to talk about and there was an event every three weeks it wasn't you know uh, like it is now where where there's an event every week and you know pretty much every week like this break we've had is like is strange because we haven't had a break in so in so long like it's been it's been show after show after show but back then you know there was limited spaces and the Irish MMA market as I said just like when we had had it was just kind of small chances with like Colin Robinson and Tom Egan that hadn't gone well and you know being a Cage Warriors champion was like a huge thing back then uh, on the scene but in terms of the UFC looking to sign you it, it didn't really mean anything or didn't def didn't guarantee anything anyway like even if you look at Carl Pendred you know being the the champion there Chris Fields being the champion at Cage Warriors you know it it, it definitely didn't mean uh, you were getting signed to the UFC and even you know Chris Fields went too tough and didn't even get signed to the UFC so it, it, yeah as you said it was a completely different time and it was it, uh, it, it was unfortunate for Owen Roddy that he that he kind of you know uh, wasn't around slightly later um, to be in the UFC and to make that that money. But obviously, it's um, it's it's kind of worked out for him. He's got a he's got a successful gym and he, he's been a really successful coach and all that stuff. But I'm I'm sure in 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 his head he thinks about this too. Yeah, it, it's one of those ones where like. You know, like the Premier League players in the in the eighties, maybe or the early nineties, like lads who would be as every bit as good as as the players playing today to to their level. I think that's why uh, Grant Souness and them are so bitter. Bitter, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're them lads. You know, they might have been on a grand a week or something, and then they're looking at fucking you know Paul Pogba or Jordan Henderson or whatever on you know one hundred and twenty five grand a week, and they're thinking like Jesus Christ. I, it, it, how could you not be bitter though? Like, and for Owen Roddy, we saw him the other day, and I've. Never 
never seen a man with a smile on his face as much as on Roddy. Like, and you know, it's uh, it's it's great to see. I suppose, and like, it's great to see that he has had such success. You know, as a coach, and obviously with McGregor, and you know, you probably say you know, more uh, you know obviously more about this than than me or most people. But I remember, I think it was in the documentary. Uh, where before one of the fights they were like looking at McGregor was like looking at his phone like practicing you know moves before one of the one of the fights and like looking at how you'd land the counter or something and it was Roddy who was the one that was kind of there with him and it always felt like McGregor and Roddy have had a great bond Will you can you kind of speak to that a little bit like they're they're kind of still together I'm sure if McGregor was having a fight coming up yeah. and Roddy would be back with him I think you know it's like now where people in the gyms or in Ireland look up to like Connor or whatever it was before Roddy was the main man like Roddy was yeah. kind of uh, the trainer blazer he was the one you know fighting uh, UFC veterans and, and beating them and obviously when McGregor was coming into the gym he uh, he would have been you know learning from Roddy and Roddy's obviously as you said a really nice guy and he's always willing to share and learn and give and you know how can you not look up to somebody like that like uh, no ego things like that like he, he's a great example and you know I think you know throughout everything he's always held himself uh, really well he's never you know He's he, he's never had a bad word to say about anybody. Even le- he's done those interviews leading up to fights. He's he, he's not really about bad men people. He's just just an all around really nice guy and uh, willing to willing to help. And uh, probably was uh, you know kind of natural coach and has obviously gone into coaching uh, since then and been very successful. Uh, so yeah, I think it's probably you know the relationship is is kind of uh, strong because of that because. Uh, when Connor was kind of learning the trade, Roddy was was there helping him, and obviously John is the head coach. Uh, John Cavan is the head coach, and and uh, and is uh, Connor's kind of main coach, you, you would say. But he's a jiu-jitsu guy, and and Connor's a striking guy, and you know, uh, obviously Roddy's a striking guy. So maybe, yeah, I think obviously he's close with both, but uh, maybe that's where. He, you know, he obviously looks up to, uh, Connor would have looked up to a fighter like Roddy at the time. Yeah. And I, I saw, us in, you know, obviously McGregor's paving the way now and has for the last few years for guys and I'm, you know, guys like Queeley and, and others are paving the way, I suppose nowadays even as well for guys like Lee Hammond and others on the way up. But well, like, you you'd actually kind of you look at the early days, right? That we were talking about there, the early, you know the early battle zones, and just to have a fight was kind of to pave the way <laughs> back then, I suppose. Or you know that that event in Limerick, there was an article on Severe May about it before, but you know with John John Cavanaugh fought in it, didn't he, and others as well. Like just to get it off the ground was massive. But at you know we always talk about it, uh, with, you know with MMA like. The, um, uh, the early, uh, you know, obviously the Gracies fighting and the lads, you know, Dan Severins and all them coming through. They wouldn't be the the ability of the lads that are there today, but the to pave the way for the next guys that come through to to have the Tito's and Chucks who still wouldn't be at the level of the guys, whereas the John Joneses, whatever, for the Francis Ngannos and the the Cyril Gagnes and all of that. It you need all of those levels to get to where we are now, and it feels like Owen Roddy was like. He was the level that was just before everything broke through. He was the main guy just for, and he was needed. You know, on Roddy, uh, on Roddy walk so Conor McGregor could run type of job. You know, I think that was definitely, and and I think he should get a lot of credit for that. And the other guys, not just on Roddy, but you know, the likes of Chris Fields, as you mentioned there, and other guys as well. It it just feels like on Roddy is the one going on because Chris Fields, like Chris Fields, got his opportunity. You know, he got it was in tough, and he got a few injuries, and he missed out. And he can definitely uh, see himself as as unlucky. But I feels like on Roddy was like everything went right for him. And he still didn't get there, you know. And that was that's that's kind of must be really sick, yeah. man. Even for us here, and he's you know he's a kind of exciting fighter, as you mentioned yeah. there. That was the first decision he'd ever won, but it was also the first decision he'd ever been to. You know, it was kill or be killed, but Roddy, he was he was going he was going in there for an for a scrap, like there was no there was no messing about, like and uh, he even said uh, after I think it's even in the documentary, maybe it got cut out or so. I can't remember exactly. I should go back and watch Ten Thousand Hours, but he said that. Um, you know, it felt strange to go to a decision because he'd never been there, and it was just a, a strange feeling to to win by decision, uh, to kind of have your faith in the judges' hands, and he hadn't experienced that before. And a fighter like Roddy, if he had gotten to the UFC, 
kind of the way Artem got into the UFC and was exciting, people would have think, you know, uh, appreciated his style of, of going for it and he, he would have become a fan favourite. And, you know, people who who were in the Irish MMA at, at the time, he was the fan favourite. You know, the the reaction uh, to his win um, in K- on Cage Contender 14 was the biggest reaction I think we'd seen. Like, you know, uh, uh, there, like you know, maybe up, uh, you know, up there with Phil Muppeter and John Donnelly and the Gory fight, but it was a bigger venue. So I think that was kind of you know the biggest moment in Irish MMA at the time. That was absolutely huge. Like I, I mentioned before, but like beating a UFC veteran at the time, even even beating a, a tough veteran at the time was like a massive thing. Like, and it's easy to, it's easy to forget like kind of how far uh, how far we've come. Like even talking about MMA, people in Ireland and in most places, but especially in Ireland would look at you like you're a crazy person. If you, if you, if you liked MMA or if you talked about MMA and even like, you know, as obviously years later, as McGregor started coming through, we remember all those kind of, you know, TV three chat shows and yeah. uh, radio chat shows where they're just like acting. They're just don't know when, like, you know, they don't even wear gloves and just saying ignorant things like that. And, you know, they can kick each other in the head in the ground. It's it's cockfighting. It's all that stuff. And it's never been on really, you know, you'd never see it on Irish TV. You had to kind of watch it on Bravo, which was Sky Digital wasn't wasn't as um wasn't as prominent back then, you know, it was uh, kind of new. Uh and it was just an unknown sport. So these guys, you know, that kind of carried it back then, you know, a lot of respect for paving the way, as you kind of mentioned, has has to be, you know, put on their names. And even like I was watching MMA back then I was a massive MMA fan back then and like I didn't even know a lot of these fights were happening like I, I, I'm i looking at Roddy's fights here like he's winning streaks starting in 2008 to 2009 up to 2012 like I was I, I was a hardcore by, by, by 2000 and uh, by 2010 2011 and stuff and I like even MMA fans in the country they didn't really know Owen Roddy or you know Brian Moore or Conor McGregor and the way up. it wasn't like it is today and that's maybe mad for people to, to to even think like you know obviously you were up in Dublin and and maybe it was a little bit easier and you maybe got to know a guy and you you know obviously you went into the gym and you tried to do it that way for me I was like I was watching the UFC I was watching you know whatever else was on uh, you know Strike Force or Bellator or whatever was on at the time and like I I, I you would hear the other time oh, like there's an Irish guy fighting or or whatever but like imagine that for someone who was like a hardcore MMA fan or, or maybe you could say the UFC fan back at, at the time to like not even hear about this like that's how kind of under the radar a lot of this was and that's that, that that's a hard thing to even fathom today it's, it's, it's absolutely fucking incredible like I remember I went on the UG back in the day and uh, I put up like a thread and I was like, uh, is there, are there any Irish MMA fighters out there or something like that? And uh, I think Alan Murphy replied and he like sent me a, you know, powerhouse that I or whatever it was going to that and look at it. And then someone else came in with severe MMA. Maybe it was even you, maybe it's someone in. Uh, and like I started to learn about it then and I, you know, I followed on, you know, with you and, and you know, obviously, you know, I was, you know, I, I was even, I don't know, was I even writing about the UFC and stuff back then? before I like I even knew it. I remember for a long time even when I was with Severe MMA I would kind of leave the Irish MMA stuff to one side and like yourself and Andrew and the other lads yeah. would be I'm, I'm going to call you out I'm going to call you out I can't remember your what? exact words for you but you were like uh, I was like, oh, you should start to like looking a bit more to this, and you're like, no, 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 absolutely not. Nah, <laughs> but, not. but like, you were like, you were flat out refusing to even listen to me. <laughs> I was like, couldn't even make my argument to you. I knew my but, uh, no, but you, well, you were. I was actually talking to Harry about this the other day. You were always ringing me like non fucking stop trying to get me to come to Severe. I remember one time my friend JJ was here, and you and like he, he like he'd called out or called up from Kerry. I, I actually I think he was on from Germany or somewhere, and we were like going to piss, and you got me on the phone, and you like wouldn't not let me go off for about a half an hour and you're like oh come on no come on come over here it's yeah, you man. Agree. Yeah. it's easier to agree to just get rid of me you know? yeah that, that, that's, I think I ended up doing that in the end that's how you fucking got me over but Mission yeah you know? uh, but I like I, and I wasn't foolish either I think I was right like because like 
the likes of yourself and Andrew McGahan and stuff, you knew that scene like really, really well. Like, I'm asking you questions here. I don't know anything about this scene, only from listening to you guys. Now, later on, you, if you ask me about the UFC back then or whatever, yeah, I'd know obviously a lot more, but I, I think there's nothing wrong with admitting that either and like learning from guys like you and, and you know, if you've got Owen Roddy on for a, an interview or whatever, and, you know, your uh, 10 years of Severe MMA, um, you know, series over on, uh, over on Patreon was absolutely fantastic as well. Like, listening to all of those stories about the old school things as well and you know and you you had one with Owen Roddy didn't you it was really good you, you, yeah yeah didn't you do an interview or, or like a mini documentary with Owen Roddy as well a few years yeah, ago yeah yeah I put up a short over there when he retired we kind of sat down and watched a few of his big fights oh and, yeah it was know, from that yes 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 and he kind of said uh, you know I put up the short saying where he said uh, he's he's decided to retire so that was kind of the, the first time he'd kind of officially he officially said that I think uh, maybe maybe there was an article my memory's not great but well as you were talking there a minute ago I was like kind of thinking about you know you hadn't really you were a big UFC fan or a big MMA fan hadn't uh, hadn't even heard these events were going on and I remember like that was part of the reason or big part of the reason why I started Severe MMA in, in what 2011 uh, I got gone to an event I think it was the Chris Fields um John Redmond cage contender with my mate Curry I'm pretty sure and uh, after, I was like oh that was these guys you know definitely have some good, really good potential and it was like oh when's the next one on and try to go online and try to find out some like more information and there's just like, absolutely nothing like I, I think the were fight hounds had when I searched hadn't updated their website in like six months or something and you know they were obviously you know it's hard to go around the country if you're if you're working a job or whatever you, these events are on there used to be events on all the time like every Every week or two, there was a, like a man of war, a battle zone, a cage contender. Uh, can't even remember some of the names of the events. Uh, but Rumble and Rush. Um, there's other ones I can't remember. But uh, there was events all over the place, but there was no information about them. Like on boards.ie, there would be a f- you know a few little discussions, but not much. And that was like a big part of the reason. I was like, okay, well, I can get on to John Ferguson and find out the information I can get on to whoever runs Battlezone I probably didn't even know at the time and Andy Ryan or whatever uh, get on to them and kind of get the information and put it up and that was you know that was a big part of the reason because I uh, not that like, for you it's completely understandable because literally there was no social media where like you might come across a, a promo video there was no promo videos there was just like a card and the card will be posted on like boards that I, if even, or like, I don't know where it'd be posted. It'd be impossible to find any information basically about any of these fighters. And it just seemed like a real shame because, you know, they did have, you know, obviously they were still developing, but you could see that like, Oh, this isn't too far away from, you know, the, what you, the UFC or whatever you watch on, on, on TV at the time or on streams at the time. Uh, so yeah, that was, uh, you know, <laughs> the early times are funny because, before 2011, before I started covering the sport, like I doesn't, I don't really know what happened. You know, you hear stories and stuff, but there's no real information about what happened. You can go back and see the odd card on Sherdog and stuff, but uh, yeah, there's basically just no information. There was no YouTube to even put videos on back then, and you know, uh, yeah, it's just completely everything's completely different now. Like it's it's mad, really. I remember one of the first things I ever saw about Irish MMA is uh, during my. Christmas uh, exams in UCC in 2010. Uh, there, were, I had some of them on in Neptune Stadium down in Cork, which uh, a lot of people will know. And I like it's a vague, vague memory, but I remember there seeing a poster for like an MMA fight down there and it had been on a couple of weeks before and you know we all know what that fight was Joseph Duffy against Conor McGregor and I hadn't even heard about it like to, to, I was doing my exams there and I was an MMA fan by that stage still in college so like it was obviously very hard to watch MMA but like I got into MMA because one of my friends in college came down and made me watch Tough basically because we had Sedanta and, and and he didn't in uh, in his uh, in his apartment and uh I kind of got into MMA via that, but still, like, isn't it mad to think, like, our, our, our uh, Conor McGregor and Joseph Duffy fought, like, down the road from me, and I could have gone to it easily, but uh, I didn't even know about it until, like, a month later, until I was doing the thing. And the only reason I looked at it, like, I still wouldn't have known who McGregor or Duffy was when I looked at the thing, or even if, uh, they, were they the main event? They weren't even the main event, were they? Uh, no, it was Rosie Six and someone else. But, uh, I, like I just remember, oh, that's MMA. There was MMA here. That's kind of cool. I was like, I was a UFC fan or whatever back then, and it's it's mad to think we've come from that. And fair play to you, like you, we must give you credit for that as well. You changed the game for a lot of these guys, and you you doing that documentary, the ten thousand hours one. You doing the documentary with McGregor, 
that changed the game. It really, really did. And you pushing these fighters and you getting, you know, getting onto Jordan Breen and getting them out there. And even I saw a thing on the uh, on the old Severe MMA YouTube the other day of like uh, a screen grab from um, oh, what the fuck was the name of that show? The one Baz Rutten and uh, used to have um, Inside MMA. Inside MMA. Yeah, like I sent them in the, the, the Inside MMA. I'd send in like any if there was any kind of I think it was Paul Redman got like a, some kind of I think it was a Ryan Roddy one was it where he got the the toe hold or the yeah I think that was up with Carl Pinter and one was up as well something with Pinter. yeah 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 I used to send them in and be like oh check these out because they, they do submissions uh like around around the world of MMA or something the segment was called the camera yeah I remember like, that, yeah. that show every week like you yeah. download it on torrents because it was, wasn't possible to watch <laughs> yeah, mad isn't it yeah I, remember, I used to watch even that show as well and that's where I kind of got some of the you know some of the I suppose outside remember knowledge of it UFC connected and all as well yeah yeah that was awesome remember uh, Luke Thomas had a show on like Spike or something what was that called uh uh <laughs> so what was it Megan O'Leary was on like heavy at the time uh, heavy yeah uh, Ari- was Ari a little bit heavy I think he was for a while but, oh no well, there was like so. MMA Weekly as well back then remember them and I think they actually MMA Weekly still going maybe but yeah it was like I used to get all my information back then from the UG I used to just go on the forums and like read a lot of stuff there and uh, you know stuff would pop up about different things all the time but it, it, like it's it's very easy you know like you don't even have to click on websites now to get the information you just go on Twitter and it kind yeah. of perks. Do you remember? The, do you remember? Actually, I forgot about this. The Joe Rogan forum. Do you remember that? That was like yeah. a huge. I wasn't big on that, but it was massive. MMA. Yeah. I remember actually. Like I started a Conor McGregor thread and put the first um, video we did with Conor, or one of the videos out there anyway. And I I DM'd it in on the forum to Joe Rogan, and he was like, "Oh, cool" or something. And then he, when we went up to him. Uh, before the Holloway fight, we were like asking the UCPR people, oh, can we interview Joe Rogan for the, the thing? And they were like, oh, no, Joe Rogan's his own person. He doesn't do interviews like that and stuff and all, blah, 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 blah. all this stuff. And we were, I was like, oh, fuck, that would be great to get Rogan or whatever. And they said the same about Sean Shelby and uh, Joe Silva. Oh, no, Joe Silva hasn't done an interview in 14 years or something, she said, um, the UCPR girl. And uh, I just went up to Rogan. I was like, oh, yeah, I sent you that video. We did that video with McGregor talking about the philosophy or whatever. And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And he was like, can we do a quick interview here? And that was, you know, I put up a short of it there the other day or during the last week or whatever. And that was the interview. And there's an interview with Sean Shelby and um, and uh, Joe Silva. How did you is, How did you get that one? How'd I just went up to him and I was like, <laughs> oh, how's it going, lads? We'd love to get you for the McGregor interview. Uh, we 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 made the video because they'd seen those videos, you know, yeah. back then, like in fairness to us, they were like the best produced videos that the fucking MMA world had ever seen, like like close to anyway. And like, you know, the format that we were doing, the kind of fly on the wall that we did with McGregor ended up, you know, UFC embedded didn't exist before that. They didn't do that. Yeah. That, they basically they copied our style and started doing embedded and like rocking up at the same time as us to, to do the McGregor stuff and kind of trying to take over. But anyway, that's another thing. But uh yeah, like, you know, uh, we were doing, like, in fairness, like Gav and Paddy, uh, Gav Fitzgerald and Paddy uh, Timmons Ward were doing some really, really good stuff with me for the, the video side of Severe May back then, and pre- like, producing, like, really good stuff on, on obviously, 10,000 Hours, the Connor stuff, even the little uh, Carl Pendra video, the Neil Siri video we mentioned. Lo- there was loads of really good stuff, and I think, you know, a uh, big part of us getting the interview with Rogan and, and with the uh, matchmakers, Sean Sh- like, have you, I haven't seen an interview with Sean Shelby, since I don't even think no. or Joe Silva since so like yeah that was that was big and you know uh, part of the, like people always say oh well why don't they push this fighter or why don't they push this guy I think you gotta like you know make it happen for yourself and Connor was straight away was I think we I contacted Connor or said to him about filming with him and then he'd, he'd injured himself and it got postponed or whatever or he wasn't replying or something and then I saw him at a battle zone like it might even be in that film Muppet or uh, Rich Gorey um Battle Zone, I think it was Battle Zone Seven or Six. Battle Zone Six. Um, he he came up to me and he was like, "Oh, so when are we filming?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, well, I've been I've been messaging you, like you know." And it kind of started from, <laughs> started from there. But you know, if, if something interesting was happening, he'd give us a call and get us to come down. You know, you got to make it happen for yourself. You're you're a business uh, in in yourself, like uh, as a fighter. And he understood that straight away, and like you know, kind of gave us access, and you know waited for us in the gym that time <laughs> even though he mentioned that uh, we made him wait for 40 minutes 
So like he knew that like you know you got to make this happen for yourself. And once the UFC saw that he was you know able to fight so well with the you know being a double champion, beating Bushinger the way he did, like was obviously really spectacular, and uh, people were paying attention. And we kind of showed the the, the non fighting side of him, and it just it just all clicked really well. And you know we we've obviously been working with him. I've been working with him for a long time since, but uh, back then like you know it really it really was kind of. You know, we we didn't really know what we were doing. We were kind of learning on the job as well, and everybody was learning on the job. But it just seemed to to, to work out really well. It just it just came together really really perfectly. And in fairness to Connor as well, he's never forgotten that. I don't think like you you did you've done a lot for him down through the years and helped a lot. And you know he you know he gave us a big interview before was it Cerrone fight and obviously at Bellator there a, a couple of months ago as well. So you know. <laughs> that doesn't happen for everyone and there's a reason they did that and it's not, not down to me even though I was the one that did the interviews it's down to you and down to the lads who put in the fucking hard work and honestly like I, I, just on, on like the media side of it I know like you, you've you probably you've got probably hundreds of guys signed to different uh, organizations but I know I've got one or two signed as well by, by just talking to different people in different organizations and even recently I had like uh, one of the your the biggest person one organization telling me if you know any other fighters let me know we want more Irish fighters and it's like well yeah okay that's, that's really good and I I honestly think, like, I think the Irish fighters kind of understand that as well and are, like, for the most part, really appreciative of the media and really appreciative of what we do and what we do. And the, the kind of the, um, the relationship, I think, is very, very good. Um, and it's it's great to see him, you know, at the at the, the media days and at Peloton and stuff as well. But a lot like that's down to you. I must say, like you 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 don't get enough credit. I don't think, I, and I think you deserve a lot of it because you were behind the scenes for a long time. And obviously, you started doing this podcast, and people got to know you a little bit better. And you know, those people coming up at Peloton asking you for your autograph and stuff the last day and everything. But it, you know, to just go out there and be that trailblazer with media, but not also like. You covered it in the right way, and you asked the questions that needed to be asked, and you did, you know, you 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 hyped the things that needed to be hyped as well. But it, it was at a stage, I think, back then, where they just needed to be out there, right? Like they they just needed to, you know, they needed people like me to see interviews that you did, which I I ended up doing, like people who were already MMA fans, and it also needed like. Um, uh, a collage of stuff to be there when they hit the big time. Like I know you were a, a, a lot of the reason why Connor got on the MMA, or weren't you? Like I, I, I know a lot of different. Uh, Ariel has said it many times that he saw uh, people on Severe MMA doing interviews there. And I'm sure, Ariel, for, I think for the first time ever played. He probably hasn't done it since he played in a Severe MMA interview in full. Uh, with Connor and Andrew oh, uh, really? on the MMA air. yeah. Oh yeah, I vaguely remember that. Yeah, that's that, that's mad, isn't it? But like, how, how do you kind of reflect on that? I suppose that that like to to be a massive part of it. You're like you honestly, you're a bigger part of of the Irish MMA blow up as some of those fighters are. To be honest, like you actually are. The 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 amount of stuff you did and the effect it had is just fucking huge. Uh, I don't know. I, n- I never really think about that, but. Yeah, definitely. Like you know, uh, like getting kind of Irish MMA on TV. Obviously, Connor, but also the Fighting Irish, where like you know the that Bama card. What was it, Bama nineteen? Where Reese and Franz and Dylan and Sinead all made their pro debuts, and we followed them for we followed uh you know we followed the Redmond side of the John Redmond side of the Reese fight, but we that was obviously short notice. But uh, you know those guys ended up going on to you know. Uh, really good careers so far and hopefully even better careers uh, going forward and you know to give them exposure on TV like that was would have been a pipe dream uh, like even when we sent Connor was like oh, like you know people were in the MMA world were knew who Connor was he had the the cage wears two belts we sent a, a pitch trailer a documentary pitch trailer that you can actually you can see an update a slightly updated version of it uh, on the Severe MMA YouTube as well I think it's like if you type in like uh, old Connor McGregor uh, pitch trader or documentary pitch trader or something to come up but um we pitched it to rt and they just weren't interested at all like you know uh, so like getting on tv and obviously getting in 2017 getting the or getting the the series after the max after the one air max all getting the series on rt and getting that on fight pass and getting that on fox sports and all that stuff was was big and 
you know, it was obviously, I was proud of those achievements or whatever and getting the Universal and the the Universal um, 2017 documentary, um, obviously in cinemas and things like that. And it's done, it's done really well. It's sold millions and uh, made millions and stuff like that. So that, that that's obviously a, a big achievement. But like, you know, it just becomes normal to, it's just what you're doing. And obviously you want to be on the biggest platforms you can or the, get the most exposure for the guys that you can but even that 10,000 hours documentary some of them early three my videos that don't even have that many views they probably have like you know a few thousand not even <laughs> you know uh, the, the early Paddy Houlihan the early Roddy ones the the 10,000 hours they're all like under 10,000 or under 100,000 views but I'll be just as proud of them as I am of any kind of you know the documentary or you know um the big connor documentary or whatever and the, the fighting irish and all that stuff like to me it's all the same that's what severe May is all about though as well isn't it that's what we try to be all about it doesn't matter if you're connor mcgregor or if you're an amateur we'll give you like the same amount of uh the same amount of uh, of of interest in an interview if you're you know either of the two of them and you see it you know yeah. we've seen yeah, carl mcnally actually i sent that into inside mma as well that rolling yeah. was rolling, that on yeah, inside yeah. mma that, yeah that was on inside mma as Class. well yeah. that's unreal yeah so yeah i suppose we'll uh we leave it there um this is a very fun chat I was uh, I wasn't expecting it to go as long or as good as this. To be honest, I really enjoyed it, and I think I, you know what I think the, the, the Italian fans are probably going to be like, "What the fuck is this shit?" <laughs> <laughs> well, did you did you watch Cage Warriors Italy? Actually, we might as well. Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What, what, so, what you think I'm of it? Uh, I thought he, he it was his fight to to win, and he kind of lost it. I think. Yeah. He became very flat footed. He, he tired quickly. I, I don't know what was going on there. Um, Obviously, after all this, uh, let me out of my contract, uh, bigger and better things, you kind of have to come in and win. And, you know, I think the fight was there to win and he kind of blew it, to be honest. Yeah, he was winning. It felt like he, it felt like he gassed and then it felt like he didn't have the ability to come back like his, uh, uh, like Martignoni did and it was tough it was really really Martignoni just wanted him more I think he know? did yeah he, and he kind of beat the fire out of him as well and you know Wooding kind of Wooding kind of maybe showed the flaws he had before that everyone thought were kind of gone I suppose and that's a very unfortunate thing for him and you know now, uh, they were saying on the broadcast it was like oh the UFC are on about uh, signing him and all he was more the PFL I think than the UFC and I don't think that's much of a secret I wonder will the PFL want him now after losing that but maybe it frees him up to leave uh, that he isn't the champion anymore I don't know but you know what a night for Italian MMA you know we were talking about Irish MMA Italian MMA I think um, Ian said that they went 8-1 and one on the night but the one was a loss to another Italian Italian. So it's, you know, really, uh, I ain't at all delighted. Actually, myself and Ian uh, did a review of that. It'll be out in Sherdog, so we, we, there's no need to uh, stay uh, loads in it. But um, yeah, it was, a, it was a very, very good card. Dylan Hazan won, Carlo Pedrosoli as well. And uh, next week's UFC, Graham, uh, Viviana Arujo. Uh, against uh, against Alexa Grasso is uh, is actually a really good fight. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, you know, obviously we, we a week off between events. And they're coming back with that. Cub Swanson is fighting Jonathan Martinez. Brandon Rival as Grasscraft. That's a great fight. Uh, and then the rest of the card: Minifield versus Serkinov. There'll probably be a big, big knockout in that. Um, Nick Masimov is back. Halfway lost and so I was on the card. So it's actually, you know what? It's not a bad card uh, at all here. I, I'm actually looking as well. And maybe this is the thing we'll talk about coming up, but there's no card between um, December 17th and January 14th. So, like, almost a whole month off there with no, with no UFC. What the fuck are we going to talk about in, in the podcast? We should have fucking kept this podcast for Ingram. We could have bullshitted our way through uh, Viviana Arujo, uh, Alexa Grasso preview here today. <laughs> no, we'll, hold on, we'll, we'll, we'll just delete this and we'll keep... No, we won't. We'll put it up. But, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll leave it there. Um, yeah. Just before we go, uh, mm-hmm. you want me to say something about Spencer Kite coming yes. on board with the Rare MMA? He's uh, obviously been contributing on the the preview, the video preview shows that Ian's been doing. If you haven't been watching them, you can go out, uh, go over to the Sphere MMA YouTube, and if you could hit subscribe, and that that'd be great, and uh, check out the the preview shows and all all the content the lads have been doing. But uh, yeah, there's going to be more content coming from Spencer. He's he's moving. Uh, He's shutting down his own YouTube and coming over, uh, coming over to Sphere MMA uh, officially now. So, 
Yeah, and yeah he, it's brilliant he, to have him as part of the team. He does loads of stuff. I think he's three or four videos uh, every week. Uh, obviously, maybe that'll be adjusted a little bit over w- w- with Severe now, but it's the time to really, and I said at the start as well, it's a time to sign up to the, to our YouTube now. It's free. Like, obviously, just click subscribe because there's going to be a lot more content coming and a lot more constant content as well. And uh, it's absolutely great. Delighted to have Spencer on board. You know, it's, I love seeing a lad like that who's out there and he's trying to do you know he's trying to do it the right way as we always say and he's trying to do it his way and he's trying to do it without the kind of the drawbacks of doing it for you know um for for someone else maybe and we are the type of people who like to do it that way as well you know i i think from from day one you've always been like that graham when i've come in i've basically been able to do whatever I wanted within reason I suppose and I think Spencer is the perfect guy for that as well and his his love for MMA is evident and his uh, the way he shines a light on the fighters obviously outside of Ireland like we do in Ireland is I think a perfect fit for us and I'm delighted to have Spencer on board and uh, you know people probably know Spencer very well obviously you said he's on the preview show but as well he's on the state of the UFC show we have, which is very 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 well liked actually Our, uh, the most listened to podcast we've had in the last year is myself and Spencer doing a state of the UFC gram so you know there was, I saw there was a lad last week saying that over and <laughs> There's a lad on Twitter saying <laughs> yeah, the podcast isn't as big when you aren't done it, so that must have blown up your I'm head. Right, yeah, sorry, I had, to, I had to whip out my uh, my alternate account to, <laughs> to save myself from the Philip the McDonald. Of Spencer, Spencer <laughs> Philip, Philip McDonald, Philip McDonald, that's it. But, uh, all right, we will uh, we will leave it there. Thanks everybody uh, for listening. Patreon.com forward slash Severe Man Podcast. If you want to support uh, everything we talked about here, all those years that Graham has put in and myself even a little bit have put in. If you think, you know, uh, some people say, you know, why'd you get paid to do these things? It only takes an hour and five minutes here to record this podcast well it took fucking 15 years to get the ability to uh, record this podcast like you have here Graham so is that worth a 450 a month for for your enjoyment maybe it is so if you think it is patreon.com for a severe my podcast and and if you could actually we've been trying to push the youtube uh, the severe art arts youtube severe my youtube uh, recently and we've gained a good few subscribers we're still only at eighteen thousand, so uh, maybe a lot of people who are listening to this, um, you know, don't uh, can't afford or don't want to um, support the Patreon. Maybe, maybe they already follow us on social medias, but don't follow us on on YouTube. And if you could go over there and give us a give us a, a subscribe on YouTube, that'd be great. Yeah, indeed, and on this uh, audio bed as well, or on the audio. Uh uh, feed so yeah we leave it there Graham thank you very much for today and for all you've done down through the years as well uh, thank you to everybody for listening and we will leave it with a quote from the great man himself go on Graham so I broke into the palace with a sponge and a rusty spanner she said hey I don't know you and you cannot sing I said that's nothing you should hear me play piano <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you the queen is dead boys and it's so lonely on a limb <laughs> we'll see you next Sunday good luck